we're going to get into the Word of God today, and the message, as I mentioned, is fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And as God revealed to me a long time ago, if it's God's pleasure, if it's God's workmanship, if it's God doing the work, then what is to ever prevent that from taking place? Nothing can stop that. God's moving in a mighty way. We've talked about the Shemitah year that we're living in. We're talking about the coming year, which is starting on September the 13th and 14th of this year, going into a time where we're going to have a celebration of this Jubilee year. And what's going to take place, nobody really knows at all, but I do realize that the United Nations has this gigantic conference that they've spelt out will take place the latter part of September where the Pope will come in and try to organize the religious groups around the world to help 3 billion people. That's the poverty-stricken 3 billion people of the world. Saying that there's no way as they kick off this new agenda for the 21st century, there's no way we can continue to live as we're living and sustain this type of living. In other words, we can't continue to mine or bring out of the ground enough coal, oil, or gas to be able to sustain our living. So basically, well, you know, there's things that we need to take a back seat on and try to bring everyone to the same level of living throughout the entire world. Many people in the United States that are the greatest consumers will have to take a back seat or reduce their level of living. All these things are on the books. We know that this is their plan. It doesn't mean that the wealthy families of the world are going to lower their standard of living. Absolutely not. It's meaning that we're simply taking out the middle class in general. We'll have the upper class. We'll have the lower class. You'll be nothing but a bunch of working bees. We'll reduce the population as we try to do in the year of 2000 on Karl Marx's birthday of May of 2000 where we want to reduce the population of the world from 6 billion to half a billion. We only want 500,000 people to exist within the world. They'll get their wish. But it will happen after the rapture. It will happen during the four horses of the apocalypse when even in that short period of time, one third of the world's population will be reduced. People will lose their lives as God points out in the book of Revelation about Jesus Christ in the seven years called the 70th week of Daniel that you and I have talked about so many times. As I mentioned two weeks ago, we believe the scriptures strongly support a pre Tribulation, rapture, your children of the Most High God, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. When Jesus Christ calls out, He says you will be caught up to be evermore with the Lord Jesus Christ. When that last trump sounds, as He mentions, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, He says, to be evermore with the Lord in the air. So I praise God for that. Amen. So you and I can say, well, you know what? I, I've had fears. Well, this is what God showed me this past week. Down in Alabama, we were there from Friday through Tuesday. I was with my bro brother-in-law on Tuesday. We were talking about expanding his, his shop. We were, he's talking about putting on a, a paint booth and uh, expanding it by at least 1,200 square feet. So we went over to a local farmer, a friend of his, who owns a number of hundreds of acres of land. And he had hundreds of sheep out in the pasture. And God just brought me to the place where I'm driving through the pasture in my truck with my brother-in-law that they were lying down in the cool shade and the tall grass as God tells you and I. He will cause us to lie down in green pastures and He will lead us beside still waters, meaning that there's no reason for you and I to ever fret. I don't know about you, but the Holy Spirit constantly reminds me of who I am in Christ Jesus. I am the beloved of the Lord. Even as Jesus Christ is described by the Father that He is the beloved Son, I am in the beloved Son, and I am beloved by my Father. Amen? You and I know that the enemy always tries to rob us of that. In the book of Matthew, the third chapter, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, He came up, and the Holy Spirit descended upon Him like a dove. The Bible said when the Holy Spirit descended upon Him like a dove, a voice came out of heaven from the Father saying, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He said, amen. Now, when it came to the next chapter and Satan tried to tempt Jesus after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, he said, if you be the son of God, if you be the son of God, command that this stone be turned into bread. And Jesus, of course, answered him by telling him this. Man is not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But Satan said, if you... Be the Son of God. Not because you are the beloved Son of God, 
He didn't remind him of who he truly is. He tried to put a question mark in his mind saying, if you are. And that question mark comes in your mind and mine all the time. We have even saying here today that there were some ifs. There's no ifs. You and I are children of the Most High God. We're the rights of God in Christ Jesus. We've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. You've been sanctified and declared holy because of what Jesus Christ has done for you at the cross of Calvary. Amen? And you might say, you know what? Right in the midst of my battles, right in the midst of my fears, I declare that I'm the rights of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I was flying into Chicago Midway on a Thursday night. I landed about 12.30 Friday morning and came in and literally I, I sleep on the plane all the time. And I appreciate pilots that land so softly that they don't wake me up. But this guy slammed this plane down, boom, on the runway and then immediately reversed the engines and put on the brakes and we came to a, a quick stop. The next day when I was, of course, someone picked me up, it was our executive vice president, and him and I had about a three-hour trip, so we got to the Grand Rapids, Michigan area about 3.30 in the morning. We got into a hotel Friday morning and had three hours of sleep before we had a meeting on Friday about 9 o'clock, 8.30. I said to him, I said, the way the pilot slammed that plane down, he said, it's called one of the shortest runways, he says, we have in the United States. They have to do that. It was a mistake. He did that on purpose. My point in saying that is it can startle you and you can be filled with fear and you can say, oh no, what's going wrong? What is happening here? And it's, it's all controlled. There's not a problem here. You just, you just think there's a problem. And so many times that happens in life with imaginations that we have that they get out of control, whether it be our family security situation, whether it be financially or physically, that maybe someone has some sort of ailment. My wife is going through a battle uh, the last couple of days and, and I had one last night that was kind of tormenting. But you know, you can have all sorts of imaginations about what really is wrong in your body. And God says that by my stripes you have been healed and that you're a child of the living God and I've touched you and gave you uh, divine health in the name of Jesus that you and I can stand upon a work that's been finished completely at the cross of Calvary. I do believe so many times that's what the church loses sight of. We lose sight of the fact that, that we're born again, that we're children of the Most High God, and in Christ I live and I move and I have my being, and that every part of my life, every walk of my life is secure in Christ Jesus. And that's the comfort that we have with our children as well. That every one of them are saved children, all ten of them. I have 16 grandchildren, number 17 on the way. And we are not only God's kept in the favor of God under the righteousness of God, but we're God's forever. He says that we are greatly beloved. And that's what you have to declare in the name of Jesus. I declare what God says is true. For he says, everything that God says is true and let every man be a liar. For Satan is the one that's a father of lies and in him there is no truth at all. He's the one that's always trying to convince you otherwise from what the word of God says. Amen. So look what he says up here in the scriptures. We're going to get into them today. We're talking about the book of Luke, the 12th chapter. And I'm opening this up with something that you are very much familiar with because Matthew the 6th goes through the same commentary of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've had people so many times concerned because we're preaching on the end times. Look, you can't change this. This is going to happen. You, you can't change the Shemitah year that's, that's coming to a close. And what's taken place the last two Shemitah years, as well as Shemitah years in the past, that there is an economic downturn in a big way that people are saying could be a total financial collapse. And I do believe that God is able to provide for you and I, as I mentioned two weeks ago, He's the one that took a million and a half of people out of Egypt. He led them across the Red Sea. He gave them water out of a rock. He gave them a cloud, he says, of protection and shade by day and a pillar of fire by night. To keep them cool in the daytime and to keep them warm at night. To show them that he was always present with them, never leaving them nor forsaking them. Gave them food, he says, even bringing in quail, bringing in manna. So many years where God fed them. And he said after 40 years of time, after 40 years of time, you find out that there was absolutely not one person he said they had their feet to swell, their clothes to wear out. They were kept by the power of God. They went out of Egypt, he says, not one feeble one in all their tribe, regardless of their age level, they were able to walk. They were strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Amen? Amen? And you and I are the same way. So he says this, and he said to his disciples, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body which ye shall put on. In other words, quit worrying, people. 
Why is it that you sit up all night trying to worry about the things of the Lord? Realize I'm the one that holds tomorrow. I'm the one that loves you with an everlasting love. And I'm making sure there's a full provision made for you through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as a father, I, I worry when my children worry. I don't want them worrying. I don't want my children to worry. I don't want them to be caught up with the, with the fear of this world. I don't want any of those things to take place. So I, in some way, if I can, try to bring some comfort. But God is able to, because He is the comforter, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. He is the encourager. He's the one that's always there to lift you and I up and point us back to Jesus Christ, who we are. You and I should be listening to Him, saying, thank you, Jesus. I give you glory, Lord. I was, I was talking to my sister down south and. And we were, we were talking about different things where God's raised us up and given us healing. He gave me healing in my body in a miraculous way, I said. And I was talking about Isaiah 38 where the enemy tried to plant in my mind that, that I need to set my house in order because I was going to die because I've had some type of skin cancer and it's already gone rampant now. And, you know, you, you need to set your house in order because you're going to die. And we realize that the prophet, the Bible tells us, came to Hezekiah and told him that he needs to set his house in order. And after he left, God said, now go back and tell him that he's going to live. He's not going to die. We realized that Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and said, Lord, I've lived before you all the days of my life with a perfect heart. And I can say that not that I've lived myself. Gary has lived before God with a perfect heart because I have not. But I'm in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus is in me. And because of Jesus Christ, who's lived before the Father with a perfect heart, fulfilled the entire law, was not guilty of any of the law, He's the one that I'm in. I can say to God, God, in your Son, Christ Jesus, us being one, realizing as you love Him, so does He love me, and so do you love me, that I am perfect in your sight. And then God took me on to say, you know what? I'm going to show you that I'm going to turn. He says, Hezekiah, I'm going to turn. He says the sundial back 10 degrees. We talked about that being 40 minutes, being a number, really 40 being judgment. God did say, I'm going to take the judgment away from you. I took the judgment away from you 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary when I defeated your enemy. Amen? Amen. So you and I see in Jesus and everything that crosses our pathway. Like I said two weeks ago, if you can't see Jesus in the word, you need to look again. If you can't see the love of God in the word, you need to look again. If I'm going to preach to you and every single minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ preaches to you from a pulpit, we need to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, Paul said. For I will glory in nothing, he mentions as he closes Galatians saying, I will glory in nothing outside of the preaching of the cross and Jesus Christ who was crucified. Because every single word that's going to help you has to be reflecting Jesus Christ. I said Philip when he spoke with the Ethiopian. Two weeks ago, the Ethiopian eunuch, after he came up out of the waters of baptism, or even before then, he said, simply, I open up the book to you, Isaiah 53 is reading from, and he taught to him Jesus. If you're in a Bible study, teach Jesus. If you're having a home Bible study, teach Jesus. If you're telling your children about Jesus or about the Word, tell them about Jesus, for he is the Word. He's the living Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among you and I, and Jesus Christ came filled with grace and truth. And He's poured the abundant life into your life and mine, so He's taken away the worry and given you and I security, and that security happens to be an eternal security. Look at what He says here. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than rain. Consider the ravens that they neither sow nor reap, which they either have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls of the air. If the sheep can lie down in the field, and people talk about this, my, my brother-in-law and sister went to a, a cowboy church last Sunday. He asked us if we wanted to go. We said we couldn't make it. Pretty deep. They had hay bales up front for the altar. If you had a dog, you could bring it on a leash or any other item. We could bring it into the church. But they had a big old feeding trough for a baptismal pool. But the guy that was up there preaching was talking about cows and talking about sheep. He says, how you know, cows have to be driven, but sheep have to be led. And they spoke to them about being dumb sheep. But I want to remind you of something. This is what God hit me with. He says, sheep aren't dumb. Sheep are wise. See, sheep are wise in knowing that they don't know the good path, but their shepherd does. See, you're not, as you're classified as a sheep, you're not a dumb sheep. You're a wise sheep because you realize that your life is wrapped up in your shepherd. He's already made a very secure way for you, and so you rest in that. I don't have to be driven. I'm simply led by the Spirit of God. 
I am led by the shepherd, Jesus Christ, who declares himself to be the good shepherd, and the good shepherd has never lost one sheep. Now we realize even in the days of David, David never lost a sheep, but he was a picture of Jesus Christ. The, sheep, uh, the shepherds back then were given 100 sheep. Jesus has a parable regarding that. There was 99 that didn't go astray. There was one that went astray. And he, went, he got the one that went astray and brought it back. And there was great rejoicing. Even as there is in heaven over one sinner, he says, it comes to Jesus Christ and repents. And there again, we realize that's just simply a change of mind. A person that recognizes, I'm not my God. Jesus Christ is my God. Amen? He is my Savior. He is my Lord. Which of you, with taking thought or worrying about anything, can add to a statute one cupid? Is worrying going to change the circumstances? Absolutely not. He goes on to say, if ye then be able to do that thing which is least, or not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? If you can't do the little things, why are you worried about the big things? You can't change things. But God truly is the one who guides your life. He goes on to say, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet, I say to you that Solomon, all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. God taking care of every single lily of the field. I, I'm down in Alabama, and I, I like to ride the property early in the morning with a four-wheeler, and I like to see what God has going on, you know, just even with, with the nature that's around us. But I like to walk it sometime. Because I like somebody put a comment on Facebook Walking in nature will always give you more than you are actually seeing. In other words, if you will stand still and pay attention, you'll see things mildly around you that you can't even imagine. It's all from the creative hand of our Almighty God. I rode back towards a, a food plot that I have, and I see a deer jump up and, and just kind of like jump over the high grass and things until he disappeared uh, in the southern part of our property. The hand of Almighty God who takes care, he says, of everything upon this face of the earth. And you and I are much more valuable, he says, than things that are today in the, uh, in the field and tomorrow in the fire. That's what he says here. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will ye clothe, will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And then he says, and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be of, of, of a doubtful mind. And he goes on to say, For all these things do the nations of the world seek, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. He goes on to say, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all things, all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus is all that you and I need. He's our great provider. He's our Jehovah Jireh. And he goes on to say this, Fear not, little flock, this is where we're at. I wanted to go through those scriptures ahead of this, because God has everything covered. He has your daily provision, temporal provision, already covered. He has your eternal provision already covered in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what are you worrying about? The work has been finished at the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ declared it. You and I are living in victory every single day. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Who is mightier than Almighty God? No one. Jesus even tells us that in the book of Revelation that He is God Almighty. He tells you and I that we've been made king and priest by His precious blood. And so here's my point. You say, well, pastor, are you, you bringing those things to our attention to convince yourself, convince us, or what? No, God is always bringing these things to our attention as a means of assurance. I'm assuring you. I'm comforting you. I'm even hugging you. I'm loving you. I'm pouring out my tender mercies upon you. He tells us that his tender mercies, they endure to a thousand generations. I will never remove my mercy from your life. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If it's God's good pleasure to give me the kingdom, what in heaven and earth can stop that from happening? You can say, well, you can make decisions of your own. We mentioned last week that God said, no man, Jesus said, no man is able to harpazo you out of my hand. No one is able to harpazo you out of my Father's hand. You can say, well, you don't know some of the things. I don't care about some of the things. I know the blood of Jesus Christ already took those things away. I know that God's grace is greater than all my sin, we say. All my sin. You say, well, you know what? That means if you don't do it on purpose. Well, let me tell you something. All of us have done it on purpose. And that goes even to Hebrews 10, 26. I've had people when we sat down for discussions and pastor one time telling me, well, you know, if you, if you sin willfully after coming to the knowledge of Christ, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. Total misinterpretation of that scripture. He's talking about law. He's talking about grace. 
If you're trying to conquer or trying to make sure everything's right so that you're accepted by God by keeping the entire law, realize all of us have failed of it. Not one of us have ever kept it outside of Jesus Christ who is perfect. And we who are imperfect have been made perfect in Christ Jesus to worship the only one who is perfect. Amen? He goes on to say this, that you and I, because of the new covenant, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, have been made righteous. And if you want to reject that way, there is no more sacrifice for sin. There is no other way for you to make whole. There is no other way for you to be made righteous outside of Jesus Christ as the one who took our sins upon himself at the cross of Calvary, died, buried, and rose again, and came into our life declaring us righteous in himself, clothing us in his white robes of righteousness. Amen? That's what he's done. Because I've seen it too many times where someone says, well, you know, they sin willfully. Now, listen for a minute. Listen to that. If someone says, I, if you sin willfully after coming to a knowledge of Christ. So if I sin willfully after I became born again or came to Christ, then there remains no more sacrifice for sin. In other words, I can't be forgiven. If you go by their context, if you go by their evaluation of the scripture, then there's no forgiveness after someone who ever sins willfully. And that's exactly what they're trying to say. In some way, they say, well, you know what? I didn't intentionally do that, therefore I have forgiveness of sin. But if I intentionally do that, then I don't have forgiveness of sin. All you have to do is take someone down and start going through the Scripture slowly and say, is this what you mean? Because if that's what you mean, none of us have any hope. And I thank God that we have hope because Jesus Christ is my hope. He's my door of hope. He is my lamb, he says. It took away my sins at the cross of Calvary so that when I came and had all my sins transferred to Jesus Christ, we realized the high priest looked upon whether the lamb was without blemish or not. He wasn't looking upon the sinner. And God did the same thing. When he looked down upon his son, who's the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world at the cross of Calvary, when he looked upon him, he wasn't looking upon you and I. He was looking upon all of our sins that was placed upon him and said, yes, that's an acceptable sacrifice. It's taken away all the sins of the entire world. He rose again the third day, and I'm satisfied, he said. The resurrection of Jesus Christ declares that the Father has been satisfied with the sacrifice that's been offered to take away the sin once and for all. Amen? Amen. So he goes on to say this. In Hebrews 7, chapter, the first verse, we realize that I believe this is a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ in Melchizedek. But I want you to see something here. He goes on to say this. Now, when, when we talk about Salem, you know, that means peace. Salem is peace. So we realize he's the king of Salem. But when Abraham, in the days of Abraham, when he offered Isaac upon the altar, if you go to Genesis, the 22nd chapter, the 8th verse, you realize that he was going up on Mount Moriah. He was taking Isaac up there, and they had nothing but the wood and the fire. They didn't have a sacrifice. And Isaac's asking his father, Father Abraham, I, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And there's Abraham saying, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Upon Mount Moriah, Jesus Christ was a sacrifice that God provided. The point in saying that is that Abraham declared that place to be Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Now realize that Mount Moriah is part of Mount Calvary just outside of Jerusalem. So when you and I think about, as God says in the book of Psalms 122.6, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem for all those who love Jerusalem, he said, shall be blessed. I want you to see this. Salem is peace. What is Jerusalem? It's actually Jari. Jari Salem. God has provided Jehovah Jari as Jehovah Shalom, which is Jerusalem or Jari Salem, he says. That you and I, because of the work that was accomplished, that we have the great provider, that Jehovah Jari does not only mean provider, but that God sees everything. God sees it all. God sees the plans of the entire new world order. He sees exactly what's take, taking place in the Feast of the Tabernacles this year or even the time when the United Nations gets together with their new agenda for the 21st century. God sees all of it. Not moved by any of it. As you and I in the place of Jari, Salem, Jerusalem, Jehovah Jari, Jehovah Salom. Amen? That's what God has. So I, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of want to get out of the Gideon mode. That says to the angel of the Lord, wait a minute, why are you picking me? Or why are you calling me a mighty man of valor? I'm, I'm the least in my father's household. And my father is actually the least of all the tribes of Israel, which is Manasseh. And God says you're a mighty man of valor. If you're listening to the Holy Spirit, he's calling you a mighty man of valor. 
He's calling every woman a mighty woman of valor. You are in Jesus Christ, whose victory over death, hell, and the grave. Amen? That's what he says. So he says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem. So here we have a picture of the pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ, whether you care to say that or not. My point is, he is king of righteousness. He is king, he says, of peace. So there we are, king of righteousness, Jehovah Sekunu, and also he is king of peace with Jehovah Shalom. Identifying this, which is king of peace. Go on the third verse, please. Without father, no beginning, no end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's, he's before the Alpha. He's after the Omega. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made unlike unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. You have a faithful high priest who's touched with the filling of your infirmities, always making intercession for you, declaring this in the Father's presence. When the accuser comes up before God and says, look at what one of your children are doing. And we find out Jesus says, it's finished. Yeah, but you know what? They're going to do it again. It's finished. Yeah, but they haven't stopped and they're not going to stop. It's finished. See, grace is greater than all your sin. When you bathe someone in the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit that declares unto you the finished work of Jesus Christ and it is finished, you find out that people simply melt. People fall in love with someone who's so in love with them that my eyes are finally being able to be open to see the magnitude of this love that's in Christ Jesus my Lord. Amen? Amen. Without father, without brother. Uh, mother, I'm sorry. Did I finish that third verse? Okay. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham, he said, gave a tenth of the spoils. This man saw him as the eternal salvation, being Jesus Christ, King and Lord of all. Let's look at the next scripture we have up here. This is Hebrews 7, 17. Because there, there's a mixture that takes place. I mean, there's a mixture of the day of Ananias and Sapphira. The people don't understand it. Ananias meaning grace and Sapphira meaning the law. There was a mixture of the law in the early church that God forbid to take place. And so many times people think this is because of a lying situation. It wasn't because of lying, it was because of a mixture. It's because the church, early church, tried to bring a mixture. Now, we're, we're not mixing. This is all grace or it's all law. There's no mixture. Either it's grace or it's works or it's works or it's uh, grace, but it can't be a little bit of both. It's either, well, you know, pastor, you go too far with the grace side. No, you've actually gone too far in trying to say the law is obtainable because it's not obtainable. Only Jesus Christ did it. And it could never bring righteousness is what he's saying here. For he testifies thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is what he's telling you and I. We are a priest forever. Same thing Revelation 1 says. You have been made kings and priests because of the blood of Jesus. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What is the order of Melchizedek? We just talked about it. King of righteousness, king of peace. That's the order of Melchizedek. That's what you are, he says. And he goes on here, he says, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness, the weakness of the law. The law can tell you where you're wrong, but can't do anything about it. Grace can tell you that you've been made righteous in Christ. Jesus and Christ fulfilled the entire law. Not to be fulfilled in you, but you, Christ already fulfilled it. So every time you're a failure and Satan tries to bring guilt and condemnation, the Bible tells us that we've overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I'm going to tell you about the blood of Jesus Christ that washed away all my sins, and that's my testimony. He says, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. But the 19th verse, For the law made nothing perfect. How is it that you and I think that, well, you know what, I've been washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ, and I need to go forth perfecting the law, so I'm actually ending up perfect. Please. He said, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of a better hope did. Jesus Christ is my door of hope. Who is my hope? Paul says that in Colossians, the first chapter. The mystery of the gospel is Christ within you, the hope of glory. But bringing in a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto You can't draw nigh unto God unless you're perfect. I've been made perfect in Christ Jesus. Therefore, God and I, we hang out. I mean, I'm close to Him and He's close to me. He's always revealing this to me. Now someone can say, well, you know what? You're just going down this path because you, you've got some secrets you want to hide. I'm not trying to hide any secrets, believe me. 
I, I, I could, you know, I'm not even going down that street right now. But I'll tell you right now that we, we've been made righteous in Jesus Christ. And my point is, I don't care how far or how bad or whatever anyone thinks they are. I'm telling you of a better hope, he says, which is Jesus Christ, which brings you into the presence and fellowship and night of God. Not, he says, be excommunicated out of his presence ever again. You are adopted into his family, a child of the living God forever. That's what he says. He goes on to tell you and I this as we want to finish up because this is one of the most comforting. Let's jump over to Proverbs 3 and just go to Psalm 23 as we close here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11 tells you and I about the end times. And like I said, we could, we could talk about this. I could tell you things that I've studied regarding prophecy that you probably studied yourself. And you know what it does? It does nothing but bring anxiety and fear. Now, nothing wrong with talking about that. But you need to point people in the direction of there is no fear in Christ Jesus. There is no turmoil. We don't have to worry about a thing. Christ Jesus is our Savior and our Lord and truly is our life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I, I read that in every single funeral service that I hold. Because I find out of these six verses as an impactful word of God because it is declaring unto us the redemptive names of Jesus Christ. I've gone over this in a sermon by itself, but just quickly I want to go through this. Back to the first verse, please. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my Ra'ah. He's Jehovah Ra'ah. He is my Jehovah Jireh. Two redemptive names in the first verse. Amen? He is my shepherd. He is my provider. Because of him I have Jireh Salem, or I have Jerusalem, whereby I abide. Maybe not in the physical realm, but I truly do that in the Spirit of God. The second verse goes on to say this. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. As I mentioned, when I was riding throughout that entire pasture, number of pastures, all these white sheep out there, all of them lying down after being shorn. In other words, they had no covering, God says, outside of my covering. When you talk about sheep being shorn in a field, all of them look like they're running around out there naked, you know? The point is this. Every one of them, he says, are under my covering. They're under my care. They're under my protection. He made me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. That's declaring that he is my Jehovah Shalom. He is my peace. And, and in these troublesome times, God is my peace. I can walk in confidence. I can walk in assurance. I can walk in the eternal salvation of Christ Jesus my Lord. Look at the third verse. And what he says here. He restoreth my soul. He is my Jehovah Ra, Rapha. Which means he is my healer. He brings healing to my life, emotional healing. He brings in the physical healing. He brings in every part of healing because he is who he says he is. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's my healer. He says he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Jehovah Sekunu, which is the Lord, my righteousness. The Lord, the capital L O R D, according to the book of Jeremiah, the Lord is my righteousness. I am righteous because Jesus has made me righteous. And then he goes on to say this. Look at the fourth verse. He says here, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, he says, they comfort me. He's my Jehovah in this side. He's my banner over me. He's my covering over me. He is my protector. He's my Jehovah in this side, he says. And then he goes on to say this in the fifth verse. He is my Jehovah Shema. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. He says, my cup runneth over. Brings to my attention this. Not only is he my Jehovah Shema, which is, means he's always present with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. I want you to see this part. Makedish. Jehovah Makedish. What does that mean? He's my sanctifier. He sanctified me. See, people think that through holy living, I am holy. No, through the blood of Jesus Christ, because of Jehovah of Kadesh, he says, you are holy. I'm holy because he made me holy. And then finishing up here, he's my Jehovah Shabbat. And this is where we're at. Please, people. End times, yes, we are. Feast of trumpets coming up. Feast of atonement coming up. Feast of tabernacles coming up. It is the fourth blood moon in two years. But there's another one that took place. Did you see this mysterious blood moon that just took place a couple of weeks ago? People said, and I had somebody call me, is that a blood moon? I said, not supposed to be. But God brought another blood moon, only visible in the United States of America. Worldwide, only visible in the U.S. Why? 
It seemed to fall at the same time the Supreme Court ruling fell. Take it for what you will. The last time we had four blood moons as far as Feast of uh, Passover and Feast of Tabernacles, last two years and this two years, uh, 14 and 15 I should say, the fourth one being on the Feast of Tabernacles, was 70 AD when Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, was destroyed by the Roman Empire. So these things, but God tells you and I, this is the way we live. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's where, that's, that's where we're walking today. Surely goodness and mercy shall hunt me down and overtake me all the days of my life. I can't run away from it. And I will dwell where? In the house or in the presence of my Lord Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Long stay.